Welcome to the Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott, and this is dedicated to all those spirits out there who believe life is meant to be magical and fun. Here we venture to share the very mysteries of self and reality. My purpose is to help light that spark inside of you, to reawaken your sense of fascination and awe towards the world. I'm going to try to help you hack reality and unleash your potential and open unlimited possibilities of wealth, health, and relationships in your life. Welcome. So excited you can join me today. Today's episode of The Reality Revolution is some study notes and analysis, a deep dive on Cynthia Sue Larson's first book, Reality Shifts, When Consciousness Changes the Physical World. I've done reviews in the past, a couple episodes This is probably going to be a little more detailed. I am so, so excited. Coming up in a couple of days, I have an interview with Cynthia Sue Larson for The Reality Revolution. Now, if you have not heard of Cynthia Sue Larson, she is incredible. And in many ways, her books provide a physicist's explanation of how reality transurfing works with more specific scientific information and it really works in conjunction with reality transurfing and parallel universes of self and a lot of the books that explore the ideas of the multiverse and how we can use these things as mental models and when I wrote my book and I found her books I was just blown away because it really helped me I'd had some personal experiences where I had some what I believed reality had shifted completely, major reality shift, the kind that made me question my sanity. And I went through a period where I needed to prove that, that I wasn't insane because I had, I had had this miracle happen. But then there was a huge reality shift where I was seeing, you know, if you've ever lost your keys and you swore that you put them on a coffee table, but they, then you find them on the table and, the, and you don't remember what happened in between and you for sure didn't put them there. That's kind of a tiny example of a reality shift. Cynthia Sue Larson has two really incredible books, Quantum Jumps, An Extraordinary Science of Happiness and Prosperity, and Reality Shifts. I'm going to do another episode on Quantum Jumps. uh, In my process of doing this interview, I want to do a deep dive, but I want to share this with you. You, if you follow my podcast, I've talked a lot about reality transurfing. I've had some episodes on parallel realities, but I explore all of this stuff. I think that it's kind of a a tiny little genre of nonfiction writing that is incredibly good. And reality transurfing is a part of that. So is Parallel Universes of Self by Fred Frederick Dotson. And there is just a ton of books. And one of the very best books are the two books that I'm talking about with Cynthia Sue Larson. Now, she is an author and a life coach. And she helps, she helps people understand their, how their thoughts and feelings change the world. She received a, a degree in physics and has an MBA at San Francisco State University and has helped people set and achieve extraordinary goals in optimal alignment with their core strengths. You, you can find out a lot about her at realityshifters.com. But today, we're going to talk about her book, Reality Shifts, When Consciousness Changes the Physical World. And she explains that reality shifting is, is reality is shifting all around us in this everyday, ordinary life. We have reality shifts all, all the time. And we most commonly notice these reality shifts when we set something down and it vanishes or reappears somewhere very different from where we knew it left it. Reality shifts are physically observable changes that occur without any direct physical intervention. So if you see a lamp move, I mean, some people describe crazy things and a lot of times we don't just don't notice it. Our brain is turned off to what is going on around us. We may note that the more attention we pay to the idea that reality shifts, the more we see them. And this is something that I have noticed once I really kind of focused on it and tried to become more aware of it, I'm seeing it all the time. We, in, in the biggest, one of the, the craziest, I could give you a list of about 20 and, and, and maybe I'll sprinkle those through this, but I had a, 
where an entire building had gone up in an area that I had literally stood in previously within a short week ago and there was no construction I had I had run and I ran in this area and I had been there and then there is there is a restaurant there that's not new I've had that and then you know okay doctor tell me what's wrong uh, our thoughts and feelings seem to shift reality to create the coincidences that make our lives exciting and rewarding, she says, with our wishes and prayers coming true. Even, she says, even our own bodies are capable of miraculous transformation. And she has found participating in healings for herself and others. She really, we really do have the power to change reality with her thoughts. And in the preface, she does a really good job to uh, explaining what reality shifts are. And and her desire to share some of these reality shifts and what's happening with it. And so she begins the book off with just a discussion of reality. Something that I've talked a little bit about on the show. This is the reality revolution. So, I mean, how do you define reality? And it is a fundamental question. She says reality is the fundamental essence of existence. In order to know what is real from what is not, we rely upon our senses our reasoning and our intuition our senses provide us with the physical input our mind requires to comprehend the world and our mind gives us a framework in which to place our experiences our intuition helps us feel what we what really matters to us and whether something feels out of place or just fine intuition is the inner teaching that lets us know what is right for us and what we truly need The dictionary says reality is the state of things as they are or as they appear to be rather than as one might wish them to be. And the dictionary defines real as existing or occurring in the physical world, not imaginary, fictitious, dreamlike, or theoretical. So she makes the proposal that what we wish for, dreaming and and imagine, is the very framework and foundation of everything that we create in other words the essence of all that is real springs forth from all that is not yet real every great invention starts out as a mere idea everything we build begins as something previously only imagined when we contemplate the difference between fantasy and reality we look into the very essence of how creation works we get a sense of the innermost workings of the universe itself and how something comes from nothing. Reality is like a dream, she says. It's in a continual state of change and transition. Nothing stays the same for very long. The weather changes, the continents change, shape, and drift across the oceans and even we ourselves change tremendously with time any attempt to hold on to something is essentially futile because constant change is the rule in life as it is in dreams we may feel a need for our world to be somewhat solid and stable because we want something dependable under our feet that we can rely on to be there and build upon We think we want things to stay somewhat fixed and solid, even though we actually need fluidity and change in order to grow and develop. A lack of change feels like stagnation where the flow of fresh air and water has stopped. It's it's an unpleasant experience for most people. Feeling and hearing a breeze, breathing fresh air and drinking fresh running water feels immensely more pleasurable and healthy than breathing stale air and drinking stagnant water. So she talks a lot about change, about the fluidity of reality, and does a pretty good job of kind of taking you to a point where you consider how much you really don't know, giving examples of like a a sand crab. Like, how does a sand crab look at a human? What what do they think about a human? I mean, that's uh, that kind of we are. At some level, and there's some other levels we just simply could not understand. 
She has a section on how we construct reality, and I wanted to read some of the excerpts from this, which is kind of helpful. We like to comprehend our environment, so we name things and ideas in order to think and talk about them. It is the unique way our brains and sensory systems work together that often convinces us that we're directly experiencing something when in fact our brain filters all our senses. Our brain influence both how we conceptualize ourselves and elements of our environments, how we select and store information. Some minds work in visual images, seeing pictures, while others structure experiences in words, ideas, or according to how something feels. Every person has a unique way of paying attention and storing and retrieving the impressions of what they pay attention to, whether we inter interpret our experience in feelings, visual images, or words. The way we order the universe, therefore, limits our observational concepts. And this is very powerful truth, and it made me think I was just reading Paul Selig's most recent book, which, Beyond the Known, which is a channeled book, uh, but they make this point uh, when the first time that when you, when a child is told that's an eagle, they never see it the same. When you put words on things, they um, almost immediately shift and change the way that you understand something. And so when you start deconstructing the definitions of words, it helps you get a clear idea on the subjective level of reality and how your words can change it. She goes on, goes on to say it is a well-known fact that our visual perception is full of holes. We have no photoreceptors in the middle of our retinas and we can only see our visual range of the spectrum of light. The visual range is relatively narrow bandwidth from red to violet. We do not see infrared or ultraviolet frequencies without technological tools to help us. We compensate for these perceptual limitations by filling in the holes with what we believe is there. And what we fill in can be more than half of what we believe we are seeing. Our brains do this so seamlessly that we are seldom, seldom conscious of visual gaps. This may be why we can see more information by moving around and getting a new perspective and why we often notice something seems different in visual puzzles in the Sunday papers, but don't know exactly what changed unless we compare each minute detail between nearly identical pictures. She points out Carl Prebrum, the neuroscientist from Stanford University who had developed the holographic model of the brain. And she goes on to suggest that we are view viewing only a very limited version of reality that we are capable of understanding. We already know we do not perceive everything there is. And as she points out, Dr. Prebrum suggests that if we saw reality without the mathematical computations our brains perform, we would observe a very different universe in the frequency domain without any sense of time or space. Just events. The holographic model of the brain helps explain how our brains can store so much information in so little space and also how we can best recall a memory when we illuminate it with the same kind of feeling we had when we stored the memory. Our brains also allow us to easily transfer learned skills so we can find it easy to trace the shape of a valentine heart in the air with our nose even if we've never done such a thing. Prebrim's holographic brain model explains that if our brains are converting all our memories into interfering waveforms, they're able to flexibly roll every idea around to be played with and experienced from many different perspectives. And so this very process of labeling and archiving information greatly affects what we allow ourselves to experience. And by constraining the way we identify and sort the significance of an experience, our memory structure give our minds order and cohesiveness. And I really like this particular view of how reality is created. We talk about reality in Reality Transurfing and we talk about it in my episode on quantum physics and consciousness. You're collapsing particles from waves 
there's a process going on in, in the way that reality and chemicals exist and uh, not chemicals but particles exist and sometimes when we focus on that stuff we're st- we need to step back and look at how our minds take in information and how inside our minds we create reality in our own minds by these gaps that we have to fill in. So she goes on to talk about belief structures. And while she's not talking about pendulums in many ways, she is defining how cultural attitudes and the influence of, of belief structures can change your reality. And she's talking about structures in, in particular. And she talks about cultures and gives different examples. And she talks about how we our experiences of ourself and how those things end up being created and in terms of belief structures and she and here's one quote I had outlined or highlighted going beyond our ordinary concept of self is what always brings us the greater sense of joy in life going beyond our own boundaries brings us an ecstatic awareness of how we are truly created in connection with all that is And I love this. She says, even after making a breakthrough and catching a glimpse of the universe beyond the ways we normally sense it, we usually return again to seeing the universe as a solid and physical almost immediately. When we manage to see outside the normal boundaries of experience, we often interpret our experiences in terms of our own predisposition to see the images from our framework of understanding. She goes on to talk about social resistance to expanded consciousness and that there is cultural and social resistance to expanding our consciousness in the way that we interact with reality, which is an interesting perspective. And she reminds us that we're all artists in many ways and goes on to define reality shifts as we had talked about before are physically observed changes that occur without any direct physical intervention they are mysterious appearances disappearances transformations and transportations that occur in and around us those are reality shifts now i'm asking you listening to this podcast have you experienced a reality shift and it's really interesting when you start asking this question almost everybody has definitely 75 percent and i'd like to get a poll she has some polls up on her website and she goes on to explain that some reality shifts seem to result from the intention of prayers and wishes and some involve healings related to prayers while the reason for others is not at all obvious reality shifts may occur due to choices made by unconscious thoughts and feelings creative consciousness or the conscious and unconscious collective she is definitely acknowledging and recognizing that it goes beyond just our ability to create reality and that that groups can do it even collectively and unconsciously. Reality shifts feel miraculous to those who witness them, giving one a sense of awe and wonder at the mystery of how something that seemed so solid and fixed could be affected as if by magical forces beyond one's comprehension. And they do. And so much awe that I want, you know, that that's one of the reasons that I wrote my book and, and, and I dedicate this time to this podcast because I, I've talked to other people that are experiencing reality shifts too. And then you start to realize that you, this is something that you can play around with and control when you start studying reality transurfing. She explains that she started thinking and talking about reality shifts in 1997 when she had noticed startling changes in which real physical objects and people changed. And she felt a burning need to discuss this with friends and understand what was going on. These experiences were shocking and a little bit frightening to her. 
until she realized that reality ships have been happening around her for much of her life. And it's the same with me. Once you start looking for them, you're going to see a lot more of them and it's going to be kind of fun. In fact, observing reality ships sharpens her awareness, she claims, to what's happening around her and around her perceptual acuity. And I like this. She says she feels like she's gaining a backstage view of how the universe operates, getting a chance to see how even apparently solid objects can behave fluidly and how consciousness creates reality. She says the reality shifts that she's experienced involve things undergoing rather marked changes that she doesn't anticipate, like seeing artwork in a children's book changing to a completely different illustration, a large sundial sculpture, sometimes being there and sometimes not, and keys falling out of the air. Those are the kind of things that I've seen. Other ships involve a dead cat being alive again, a person's name vanishing off of a conference agenda on all pages in the room. Bruises vanishing right before your eyes and rain starting and stopping as you look up at the sky. These reality shifts are incredibly mysterious transformations that happen right in front of you, many of which you experience with others. It's so much more meaningful to share these things. It's easier to know that something magically real really did occur when more than one person shares this experience. And... I would love on the Reality Revolution group, go on and discuss your reality shifts. I always am fascinated to hear people's stories about what they've experienced. In fact, you've probably already experienced many reality shifts and you just weren't paying attention. She believes that most of us have. Possibly you noticed a sock or two missing after you washed it. Somewhere between the washing machine and the drying machine, most inexplicably leaving you one or more lone socks with no mates. This experience is so commonplace that it's routinely joked about yet. Have you heard anyone other than stand-up comics ask the question, where do all the missing socks go? Often, socks are so small, they can and do hide inside other laundry items and can even get mistakenly folded up inside towels and sheets or hung up on hangers. What's most curious is when the socks simply vanish altogether and all other possibilities have been investigated. Perhaps you had an experience where you were absolutely sure that you set down your wallet or keys in a certain place only to return and not be able to find them. You then search around and return again to the same place where you first looked and there they are. You probably figured at that point that you must have been distracted or inobservant. You will always try to rationalize it by creating an excuse to make it seem more believable in your mind when something magical had happened. You might think that paying more attention, you could stop these events from occurring. Yet, she says that the more that you pay attention, you'll see more of it. She has an interesting section on skepticism, which I face a lot. People are skeptical of the stuff I talk about. Why don't more people acknowledge this phenomenon? And once people hear about reality shifts, why don't they call... Why aren't they enthusiastically embrace the idea at the heart of skepticism is a desire for objective examination of new ideas rather than subjective airbrushing or wishful thinking skeptics remind us of the importance of minimizing our subjective personal judgments so we may more fully experience what is really here there is a significant difference between mindfulness and skepticism Whereas mindfulness is the non-judgmental awareness encouraging us to accept what we perceive, skepticism encourages us, us towards ever-vigilant doubtfulness. The underlying premise of skepticism is that certain widely held beliefs are all that can be commonly proved to be true. So. Only that which is readily apparent to our senses and can be determined to us upon demand may be considered valid, and all else must be continually questioned. 
we're all limited by our assumptions and numerous examples in history how skepticism and doubt often appear in retrospect to be attempts to cling to long-held conservative beliefs many things we take for granted now such as cars and computers microwave out of the ovens and, and cell phones were not considered possible when they were first publicly discussed and she's making this comparison to reality shifts happening more often we've heard, you you hear about the mandela effect and that is a group level acknowledgement of reality shifts and i'll definitely try to talk to her about that as well she has a chapter on she does mention in terms of buddhism that you they believe that they happen all the time reality shifts happen all the time and that it's not good to acknowledge them and think that you're anything special for being able to change reality uh, it's an interesting perspective but the the second chapter is why reality shifts and she the one thing that she does a very good job is explaining the physics and it's probably the best explanation going actual going over the actual different theories that are available right now up to date in both of her books she talks about the different physics behind this and i could certainly go through that i don't want to read the whole book but this chapter on why reality shifts she talks everything about subjective interconnectedness change is a handshake between sender and receiver consciousness is non-local mind and matter are one and unified and she goes over several different scientific theories particle wave duality and the double slit of experiment which is of course has to be discussed when you talk about this stuff and she has a section on parallel universes and she said in fred allen's wolf parallel universes wolf describes how physicists first attempted to explain otherwise inexplicable paradoxes with the concept of parallel universes in the 50s and the notion of parallel universes began around 1935 when albert einstein and nathan rosen recognized a bridge between our universe and another possible universe in black holes the idea for parallel universes coming together in black holes began when the black holes were mapped by martin kruskal to show how the flow of time goes differently in different directions at the boundary of the black hole and these parallel universes consist of space and time just as this universe we are in and they exist alongside our universe they are infinite number of parallel yous and me's out there existing in the same space and time we live in but normally not perceived in these universes an infinite number of different choices are being made at each moment and each universe contains different outcomes from these different choices parallel universes provide a fascinating concept for the imagination for they encourage us to consider living completely different lives simultaneously just not being conscious of them all in another universe i'm a man and uh, i'm a woman instead of a man or I got married as soon as I got out of high school. All these different possibilities that we talk about. And when reality is considered to consist of parallel universes, an explanation for why observers affect the physical systems that they observe begins to present itself. Parallel universes help us to comprehend how people make decisions in their lives by con- unconsciously feeling out how the choices they will make will affect everything else if all possibilities are occurring somewhere perhaps consciousness is the connection that allows us to get some sense of how things would feel if we felt or acted in different ways and at some level we know about all possible futures we are not conscious of all these possibilities for the simple reason that such information would overwhelm our capacity to comprehend it all we might then have unconscious feelings that we would give that would give us intuitive sense that one reality path is preferable to another 
parallel universes help explain reality shifts, which, which appear as a leap in consciousness from one universe to another. So we actually see two different universes all looking and feeling equally real in every way. It's possible. Consciousness is constantly moving from parallel universe to parallel universe. And we only notice this happening when we are fortunate enough to witness a discontinuity in the transition from one to another, much as one might be started to discover the gaps between still images on a mo- roll of movie film. Now she says this, and she's talking about rolls of movie film, and it's very much along the same lines as reality transurfing. It's particularly that chapter where she's talking about, and I want to just stay here for a little bit, so the idea that we, we have a sense of these other realities that exist at the same time is discussed in reality transurfing and is discussed in books of a similar nature and it's something I believe in that's where intuition comes from so if in, an, in another in another reality you're you were in a plane crash and then you get to and remember all of time exists at the same time so you get to the airport and you f- get a feeling before you get on the tr- on the plane that something's wrong that's because you're aware your intuition is aware that you had a plane crash so in another universe taking this plane and why is it there are less accidents when they go back and look at like when there there's a train crash why are there less people on them it's a bizarre statistical significance so she goes on to give some examples of different ways that you could we have reality shifts happen such as bent coins and she goes on to explore the different possibilities she gives a, a greater explanation of the holographic universe model and goes on to do eloquently explain time and zero point and implicate order. The section on zero point associates with the space of variations a little, a little bit. And so space presents humans with vastness that boggles our attempts to know it. We wish to comprehend the source of all things and are stuck by the paradox that places that seem full of nothing more than pure vacuum of empty space can be so full of energy. Physicist David Bohm proposes there is an infinite ocean of energy and tells us a little bit about this vast and hidden nature of what he refers to as the implicate order. When a physicist calculates the minimum amount of energy an energy wave can hold, they find that every cubic centimeter of space contains more energy than the total energy of all matter in the known universe. Bone points out that matter does not exist independently from the so-called empty space. Space is not empty nothingness. It is full and is the grounds for the existence of everything. Bohm asserts that, that the, this ex, I. This excitation pattern is relatively autonomous and gives us rise to the approximately recurrent, stable, and separate projections into a three-dimensional explicate order of manifestation. Another name for the emerging paradigm of getting something from nothing is the zero-point energy. We've talked about this on other podcasts. Zero-point energy is so-called because some physicists are now considering that space appears to have vast quantity of intrinsic energy potential if what we imagine to be empty space is actually full of energy being held in balance while near in nearly infinite amounts of energy converge so that they cancel each other out then each point of space with any kind of sim- asymmetry would appear as matter this suggests that all forms of matter may be considered to be various asymmetries of the zero point field Man, there's so many things I could read from this book that are just wonderful, and this gives you a sense of what she's talking about. She does a good job of explaining what the actual quantum scale is, and does a terrific job of talking about energy. Now, the most important thing to realize when contemplating how we influence reality shifts is that we exist as pure energy. Not just people, but every single physical object, animal, and thing in existence consists of energy. 
This energy has been known as prana, ka, mana, dunamis, numa, baraka, the fluid of life. If you have not seen or felt energy fields, it can be hard to accept that they exist, even if people have been observing them for thousands of years. She goes on to say, the more skeptical among us may be interested to know that the existence of the human energy field has been experimentally confirmed by Valerie Hunt, a physical therapist and professor of kinesiology at UCLA. And she explains the experiment where they were able to read auras and use an oscilloscope screen and test muscle electrical fields and does a pretty good explanation of that. So... This gives us a more scientific idea of when we talk about raising the level of vibration. In fact, she says, when I meditate and raise my level of vibration, I can viscerally feel the sensation of higher frequencies in and around me. It's not just talk when we say raise your vibration. At times, she says she was awakened in the night to feel the bed. She was sleeping on vibrating audibly and so strongly it seemed something was shaking the bed. The shaking appeared to be an oscillation from the energy vibrations that she had felt. And when these higher frequencies vibrate within her, she can feel greater love and and most incredible things happen. I have had this too. When you start to really feel higher vibration fields and experiment with this stuff, it's truly fascinating. She goes on to explain the different states brain wave states of beta, alpha, theta, and delta. And it goes into an exploration of dimensions, spatial dimensions that go beyond just third, fourth, fifth, sixth dimensions and does a good job of describing that and having two-dimensional awareness and does a terrific job of explaining that. The research and the bibliography in this book are wonderful. And she's got section on synchronicity and time space continuum on twin soul synchronicities on changing the past on creating the future and how we create the future and does a pretty good job of possible of outlining the possible causes of reality shifts. Now she gives four primary possible causes the dissolution is the fade out at the point where one reality path connects to another the transition is usually so seamless that it goes undetected reality shifts are noticeable when dissolution of one reality into another leaves a noticeable gap so we notice a startling appearance disappearance transformation or transportation these kinds of reality ships feel like a movie seg where the one scene fades out and another fades in yet there's a noticeable difference And then she says there's the tangle of the hierarchy, which is since the universe is conscious self-awareness, it is a loop of self-referential circularity. As we contemplate our own consciousness, points of discontinuity occur at every place where an observer oscillates between two possible vantage points. And when we view the universe from one perspective and then another, the oscillation between the two points of view creates a discontinuity or reality shift. And when we consider ourselves as being purely material body and ego, and then believe ourselves to be pure and eternal consciousness and go back and forth between feeling and physical and then consciousness, reality shifts begin to to occur. She has the slipstream consciousness, which is conscious thoughts occasionally create turbulence and low pressure areas in which overlapping discontinuities occur, much the way clouds of dust and debris become airborne, fly along the wake of fast moving cars. And then she has the rejoinder feedback. Occasionally, the sending and receiving waves putting our conscious wishes into effect oscillate in a feedback pattern, like what happens when a microphone picks up and amplifies sound coming out of the speakers it broadcasts. This kind of feedback gives musicians signature sound. She mentions uh, Jimi Hendrix, and she's talking about the, the rejoinder feedback or the, uh, the, the handshake of it causing this discontinuity. This is fascinating stuff. She has some great exercises in the book on how to evaluate parallel realities and how to evaluate shifts and a better, uh, they're very good. It's a wonderful book 
and I've only gone over the first three chapters. She has a chapter on shifting reality, um, on prayer, and gives some great examples of different with stuff she's collected over time of different people having reality shifts. Very good. And she has a chapter on allowing reality shifts, being open to change, opening your mind up that we a lot of times may limit ourselves on the kind of reality shifts that we we can truly experience and opening our mind up to these can really allow us to do it by doing things like accepting and forgiving and blessing our experiences and observing our feelings, trusting our higher self, celebrating life and meditation, physical relaxation, breathing and grounding, running energy, sealing the aura, all their, all of these things can be used to allow um, some shift, allow reality shifts. Uh, and she has some great meditation techniques and I'm going to try to integrate some of these into future meditations because they're so powerful. Inspiration for reality shifts and feeling feeling inspiration. She has a chapter on that. And then a lot of the end of the book is about lucid dreaming and an exploration of living lucidly in reality now and, and, and how trying to become lucid in your dreams can help you become lucid in your reality now and that shift to becoming aware of the dreamlike nature of reality can really change everything and become knowing that you're dreaming these are things that the Vadim Zeeland talks about in reality transurfing and it's a very common idea in books about shifting through parallel realities and that is understanding dreaming that it's a similar process and if you on a regular basis just try to what i recommend just just am i dreaming ask yourself that question every couple hours if you get used to asking that question then you might be in a dream and you might be following a similar habit and you will ask yourself am i dreaming and then you'll be you'll realize that you're dreaming and then What's really crazy is when you re- when you realize you're dreaming, when you really feel like it's a very real dream, and when you start be becoming aware of those, the shift is pretty pretty crazy. She has a great chapter on on shifting using shifting realities for healing, and that when a lot of healing is major reality shifts and using light and words to help people to heal and also to maintain good health, and has some pretty good ex- stories and experiences. I don't want to go over them. You, you got to get the book, but it's how reality shifts. And then the final chapter is everyday life with reality shifts and just becoming aware of how the universe is alive, and opening our boundaries, the acknowledgments of the mysterious universe. She has a set of wonderful affirmations that I'm going, that I have already built into many of my meditations and affirmations personally. And an incredible bibliography that I have personally gone through and found so many great books from that I wasn't even aware, like Lucid Dreamer by Malcolm Godwin, Alternative Realities by Leonard George. And some of these have have given me great new ideas for new interviews in the future. The research behind this book is wonderful. I'm going to do another episode about Quantum Jumps but I really wanted to just at least dedicate an episode to reality shifts. It's such a great book when consciousness changes the physical world. And I can't recommend it enough. I'm so excited to interview Cynthia and we'll do another episode on quantum jumps and I'll read you some great stuff and just experiencing quantum jumps by itself. The physics and explanation is so good, it really helped me to understand a lot better than I had before, and we'll be talking about that very soon. So keep an um, on the lookout for the interview with Cynthia Sue Larson and the additional book review coming up, and check out all of my episodes of The Reality Revolution at therealityrevolution.com for coaching. Go to my website advanced success institute.com keep an eye out for my new book that's coming soon the reality revolution the mind-blowing movement to hack your reality i cannot tell you how much i appreciate you sharing this time with me 
going over this stuff really helps me to learn a lot but it's also great to be able to share this knowledge with people that are that are mutually interested in this stuff so keep an eye out for my meditations and additional material and can't wait to talk to you very soon welcome to the reality revolution <laughs>